We're going to dive right into the book of James, amen. We're on our, uh, we're on the fourth chapter. We're getting closer to the end of this book before we uh, dive into another, another study here on uh, Wednesday night. But praise God, you know, God is so good. Um, you know, there's things that I've been hearing that have been troubling me. And they're not new, you know what I mean? They're, they're things that, that have been happening for, you know, for, for quite a few years now, you know what I mean? In, in, in a lot of churches and in the body. I just want not in churches, but in the body of Christ. You know, I hear a lot of people say that, you know, that they're okay just with going to church on Sunday. You know, that one day of church is, is good enough for them. You know, that anything more than that is just too much. And I said, wow. You know, my heart breaks for the, for the people of God. Because, you know, it's, it's no longer about the Lord. It's about themselves. It's about themselves. And, and people really think that they're serving God and that they really love God. But they're far from him. We're going to go to James chapter 4, verses 6 through 17 tonight. And in verse 6, he says, He gives greater grace, therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And in verse 9, this really caught my attention today. I've read this book many of times, and I've never really caught this, this verse in the way that, that, that it was wrote in, in, in verse 9. And it says, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Wow. The total opposite of what everybody thinks that they should be doing. Oh yeah, let's just laugh and have a good old time. Let's let's just, you know what I mean, man. Christianity is all about, you know, having fun. It's all about love and you know what I mean. And yes, God is love. I understand that, but you know, he says something totally different here. As you draw near to God, be deeply penitent and grieve and even weep over your disloyalty. Man, it just goes to show us, you know what I mean, that a lot of us, we think we're so good. When he says that we're sinners, man, you know what I mean? And that's, it's a problem that we have because of a sin nature that, that, that we have. You know what I mean? And we have to all recognize that we have a sin nature. But you know what? Not to be so happy. You know what? Because why? Because when, when we're happy, we don't recognize that, that we have a need. And that need is God, and that need is the Holy Spirit in our life. And, and he says, over your disloyalty, let your laughter be turned to grief, and your mirth to dejection, and heartfelt shame for your sins. Man, a heartfelt shame for your sins. You know, how many of us actually feel bad for, for when we sin? You know, there's not too many people that feel bad for when, when they sin. They don't get convicted. You know, people don't get convicted when, when, when they're away from the body. People don't get convicted when, when, you know what I mean, when they don't pay tithes. People don't get convicted when, you know what I mean, when they spend too much time watching TV, when they spend too much time doing extracurricular activities. You know what, people don't get convicted when they give their time more to the world than what they do to God. And in verse 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. 
You know, a lot of people, when they, when they read that verse, they're looking to be lifted up in, in a position or for something for spectacular to happen in their life, for them to get all the, all the glory. You know, when we're not supposed to get any glory, we're not supposed to get any shine. We're not supposed to be shining like jewelry. We're not supposed to be shining like diamonds. You know what? We're not supposed to be the ones that are getting the attention. But God is supposed to be getting the attention and everything. And he says, you know what? He says, humble yourselves. So that way he can exalt you. You know, and he wants to exalt you in your spirit. He doesn't want to exalt you on an outward form. He wants to exalt you inside. Why? So that way you know who you are in Christ Jesus. So that way you can stand when storms come. So that way, you know what? You'll be ready in season and out of season. And in verse 11, he says, Don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who deframes or judges a fellow believer deframes and judges the law. And if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Verse 13, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make profit. In verse 14, yet... You do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be, for you are like vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. But he gives more grace in verse 6. The first five verses, we saw how wicked the old nature of the believer can be. Now we learn that we are not left to deal with the lust of the flesh in our own strength. You know, there's grace for every need. And we find that in verse 6. Thank God that he gives grace or strength whenever it is needed. You know, Hebrews 4.16, let's go there. Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. You know, that's that grace, man. He's right there, right on time. Right when we need it, you know, he has promised us as your days, so shall your strength be. And Deuteronomy 33, 25, he gives more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sends more strength when the labor increases. To aided affliction, he added his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplied peace. To prove that God gives grace as it, is need, as it is needed, James quotes Proverbs 3.34. But here there is the added thought that it is to the humble, not the proud, that this grace is promised. God resists the proud, but he cannot resist the broken spirit. The broken spirit, man, that's something that just draws God to, to an individual. Which leads me to, to fasting. Do you know when you fast, it's part of your, your, your spirit being broken before the Lord? Man, because you're breaking before the Lord, you know what? And, and, and fasting is, is so important for each and every single believer. You know, those things that, that, that we do, you know, I mean, the things that have a hold of us. I want you to understand something. A lot of people really don't understand this. Well, why do I have to stay away from food, Pastor? I want you to think of this, this, this real... Let me make it simple for you. Because everybody talks about social media. You know, everybody talks about, you know, about all these other things. But what has a majority of your attention? What do you think about most of the time throughout the day? Food. Think about it. 
The Lord showed me this today. What's on our mind? What we're going to eat? What's our next meal going to be? How am I going to stuff my face? Mmm, that tastes good. Mmm, that smells good. Mmm, that looks good. Food. Food has a majority of our attention. And in order for God to, 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 to break us, in order for God to, to get us closer to Him, you know what, then we have to pull ourselves away from that. We have to, you know, put away those desires that, that we want so much. You know, we crave food more than anything else. We crave food more than the Internet. We crave food more than any activity out there. Food. And that's why we should, take, we, should, we should restrain from it. Why? So that way we can get closer to God. The whole thing is, is giving something up. So that way we can give God our attention. In verses 7 through 10, it talks about true repentance. He says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. See, the first six steps to be followed where there is true repentance. James has been uh, crying out against sins of the saints. His words have pierced our hearts like arrows of conviction. They have fallen like thunderbolts from the throne of God. And we realize that God has been speaking to us. Our hearts have been bowed beneath the influences of his word. But the question now is, what shall we do? He gives us free will. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are we going to serve God? You know what the Bible strictly tells us? He says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. The God of your fathers? Or are you going to serve the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob? Man, those were the guys who left everything behind. They left everything behind to go follow God. You know what? Are we going to leave everything behind to go follow God? Are we going to follow the gods that our parents followed? And what were the gods that our parents followed? What, what gods did Abraham's parents follow? Man, they followed worldly things, man. All of their parents followed worldly things. You know what he says? That's why are you going to choose the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob? Why? Because they left all that worldly stuff behind to go follow God. The one and only true God. You know, the first thing to do is to submit to God in verse 7. And that means that we must be subject to Him, ready to listen to Him and to obey Him. We must be tender and contrite, not proud and stiff-necked. You know how many of us get into that habit, you know what I mean, when we, we get convicted, you know, or, or, or the Lord's speaking to us, or we're reading the Bible, and man, the, the, the Word of God just jumps right out of the pages to us, but instead of us, you know what I mean, listening to it, we get stiff-necked. Nah, that ain't for me, that's for my neighbor. That ain't for me, that's for Pastor Leon. Huh? That's for Pastor Leon, that ain't for me. You know, Pastor Leon needs to do that, not me. Nah, we get, we get stiff-necked. And instead of being open to him, you know what, we just, we reject him. You know what I mean? God has been knocking on the doors of our hearts since we were babies. He's been knocking on the doors of our hearts and many of us went down a path that we shouldn't. You know, some of us did some real bad things and some of us didn't do very bad things. You know what, some of us were some real good people, but some of us, you know what I mean, we were on the other side. I was one of those ones on the other side, you know, I was the, the greasers. You know what I mean? I was, I was the greasers. I was the one doing all the crazy stuff on the other side of the tracks, you know. But, you know, on both sides of the tracks, no se importa. You know, there's still people. We're all people. And, and on both sides, we're all stiff-necked. We all, you know what, have our rebellion. Instead of being submissive to God, you know what, man, come serve me. Oh, what if my friends don't want to be my friends no more? So What? Oh, what if my husband or my wife wants to file for divorce? So what? So what? 
Why? Because you know what? If you're following a person, you're not serving God. You're serving an individual or yourself. And the second half of seven, it says, then we must resist the devil. How many of you know that when the, when the Lord speaks to you, then the devil comes whispering to you? The Lord speaks to you and the devil comes whispering to you. You know, and we do this by closing our ears and our hearts to his suggestions and temptations. We do it also by using the scriptures as the sword of the spirit to repel him. If we resist him, he will flee from us. Man, we, we all know, right? How many of you guys, you know what I mean, have been? You know what I mean? There's something that, that you want to do that, that you know you shouldn't be doing. But you know what I mean? By, and you're waiting. And by the end of the day, you know what I mean? Finally, you're just like, I'm going to do it. Instead of reading your word. Instead of praying. You know, Lord, I need you right now. You know what, Lord, right now, start getting into Scripture, you know, re repeating Scripture and, and praying, you know what I mean, and, and, and telling that voice, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, they show those old cartoons with the, with the devil and the, and, 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 the, and, the, and the angel on one side, right? Same thing. That's the only way that I could represent, you know what I mean, the, the Holy Spirit and, and the enemy talking. And I've always used this illustration to make it simple for people. Why? Because it's just like those cartoons. He's over here whispering in your ear, telling you to do the things that you shouldn't be doing. But yet, you know what I mean, you don't listen to, to the angel. The angel's telling you, don't do it, don't do it. And you're... That's why it's important to fast. You know, fasting is more than just staying away from, from, uh, from food. Fasting is, is, is drawing near to God so that way He can draw near to you. you. Next, we should draw near to God. In verse 8, we do this by prayer. We must come before Him in desperate, believing prayer, telling Him all that is on our heart. And we thus approach him, we find that he draws near to us. We thought he would be far from us because of our carnality and our worldliness. But when we draw near to him, he forgives us and restores us. Man, all he wants, he just wants to spend time with us. He just wants to spend time with us. But yet we reject him. You know, a lot of you guys, you guys have, you know, you guys have been in relationships. You know, and when, when people draw near, you know, when you draw near in that relationship, you know what I mean? It's like, man, things begin to happen. Why? Because all that darkness and everything gets exposed in your life and, and the truth has to come out. Why? Because they begin finding things out about each other. Because how many of you know that a lot of us, we, we put on the, we, we, we put a, a, sh a show when we meet somebody and all we do is you know what I mean we, we speak all you know what I mean like partial truths why because we want somebody to to like us because we know how ugly we really are inside and if they find out how we are inside that they might not like us anymore you know and that's the way it is in the world but that's not the way it is with the Lord you know, the Lord, He wants you to spend time with Him so that way He can expose all that ugliness. But instead of, you know what I mean, withdrawing from Him, He wants you to begin being honest with Him and to begin speaking to Him and tell Him, you know what, Lord, man, I'm a filthy sinner. You know what, Lord, man, I, I need you, Lord God. I need you to, to cleanse this. I need you to, to heal this. I need you to take this away from me. Why? Because you're, you're exposing that stuff that's been deep-rooted in my life that I no longer, you know, want because, you know what, I, I want to be who you've called me to be and not what the world has made me to be. You know, the fourth step. It's to cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The hands speak of our actions, and the heart represents our motives and our desires. The hands represent our actions, and our heart, the motives, and the desires. 
We cleanse our hands and purify our hearts through confession and forsaking our sins, both outward and inward. As sinners, we need to confess evil acts. As double-minded people, we need to confess our mixed motives. Confession should be accompanied by deep sorrow for sin. In verse 9, it says, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. When God visits us in conviction of sin, it is no time for levity. Rather, it is a time when we should prostrate ourselves before Him and mourn over our sinfulness, our powerlessness, our coldness, and barrenness. We should humble ourselves and weep over our materialism, secularism, and our formalism, both inwardly and outwardly. We should manifest the fruit of godly repentance. Amen. Of godly repentance. Man, it's, it's everything that, that's in there, man. Man, you know what? Forgive me for, for, for being so materialistic. You know, a lot of us, we don't think about that. You know why? Because how many of you, you, have your, you got your, your likes, and you know what you like. You know, you, you have a certain soap that you like. And if somebody goes to the store and buys a different kind of soap other than the soap that you like, you no, know, I don't like that. Take it back. Nah, Father, forgive me. You know, there's those certain likes that we have. Instead of being grateful, grateful for everything. You know what I mean, man? We, we're so materialistic. You know, we can, go, we can go to a restaurant. Why do we have any business going to a restaurant if we know we're going to be complaining over some kind of food? Oh, I don't like the way that tastes, man. I, I don't like the way they cooked it, man. I, they must have put some kind of spice in I don't like that spice. That's materialism, man. That's, those, that's a sinful nature that we have to allow God to take control of. Amen. Why? Because you got comida at home. You know what? You don't like it, you're going to make the food the way that you like it at your house. But no, we, we have this habit, this na sinful nature that we don't even know about. And we're not even aware of. And we need to repent. You know, finally, we should humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. If we honestly take our place in the dust of, at His feet, He will exalt us in due time. Amen. Man, Lord, forgive me. This, then, is the way we should respond when the Lord exposes us to ourselves. Too often, it is not the case. However, sometimes, for example, we are in a meeting when God speaks loudly to our hearts and we are steered for the moment and filled with good resolves. But when the meeting closes, the people engage in animated and lighthearted conversations and the whole atmosphere of the meeting is dispersed and despised. The power of dissipated, the power has dissipated and the spirit of God is quenched. You know, when God speaks to you, huh? Same thing. Now, we've been in, the, how many of you guys, you guys, I know you guys, maybe you guys have meetings sometimes or whatever, you know, but at, at work, you know what I mean? Like, man, we have meetings. And sometimes, you know what I mean, man, God could be speaking to me, you know what I mean? And, and instead of just saying, you know what, just getting up and removing myself because anyone else in there would get up and remove themselves to go relieve themselves. Anyone else in there would get up, you know what I mean, if the phone rang and they had to take a phone call real quick, they would get up and move out of that meeting to go take that phone call real quick. You know, if somebody was texting them, I notice it all the time when people are in meetings and somebody's texting them or something, they ain't paying attention to the speaker. Man, they're looking at their text messages, man. They're looking at, oh, man, I just got a notification from YouTube. Ding, ding, ding. Let me check out that video a little bit. You know, that's pretty good. But when God speaks to us, guess what do we do? We play that song. It's like elevator music, you know what I mean? We're just waiting to get to the 12th floor. Hold on, Lord. This elevator's a little slow, but I'll get there sometime. And then we forget. And then by time, you know what I mean, it's ready. The, the atmosphere's already gone. God's like, Charlie, I'm out of here. I'm off to the next one. Forget it. You don't want to listen. I'll deal with you next week. Man, help us, Lord. 
verses 11 through 12. Say, don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who deframes or judges a fellow believer deframes and judges the law. And if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? You know, the next sin that James deals with in verses 11 through 12 is that of censor, uh, censorness. Or speaking evil against a brother, someone has suggested that there are three questions we should answer before indulging in criticism of others. What good does it do your brother? What good does it do yourself? And what glory for God is in it? Those three things again. What good does it do your brother? What good does it do yourself? And what glory for God is in it? You know, Beth Day has expressed it as follows in her poem, The Three Gates of Gold. Make it pass before you speak three gates of gold. Three narrow gates. First, is it true? Then, is it needful? In your mind, Give truthful answer. And the next is the last and narrowest. Is it kind? And if to reach your lips at last, it pass through these gates, these gateways three, then you may tell the tale nor fear what the result of speech may be. You know, the royal law of love says that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. To speak evil against a brother, therefore, or to judge his motives is the same as speaking against this law and condemning it as worthless. To break a law deliberately is to treat it with disrespect and contempt. It is the same as saying that the law is not good and not worthy of obedience. He who refuses obedience virtually says it ought not be the law. Now this puts the one who speaks evil against his brother in the strange position of being a judge rather than the one who is to be judged. He sets himself up as being superior to the law rather than subject to it. But only God is superior to the law. He is the one who gave it and the one who judges by it. Who then has the audacity to usurp the place of God by speaking maliciously against a brother? You know, the bottom line is, how dare you? Who do you think you are? In the world, we thought we were somebody. But yet, actually, we were nobodies. We talked about everybody. We pointed the finger about everybody. You know, we, we did everything, you know what I mean, to, to, to hurt people in the world. You know, how dare we? How dare we? You know, God is supposed to get all the glory and the honor. In verses 13 through 17, he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. The next sin that James denounces is that of self-confidence, of boastful planning, and independence of God. He pictures a businessman who has put complete plan laid out for the future. Notice the details. He thought about the time, today or tomorrow, the personal, we, the place, this city, the duration, spending a year there, the activity, trade, and the anticipated result to get gain. What is missed in this picture? He never once takes God into his business. 
He never once takes God into his business. In life, it is necessary to make some plans for the future. But to do so in self-will is sinful. To say, we will or I will, is the essence of sin. Note, for instance, the I wills of Lucifer in Isaiah 14, verses 13 through 14. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the highest of the clouds and I will be like the most high. Now, many Christians sound like Lucifer themselves. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over there. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to go to prayer. I'm not going to pay my tithes. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to fast. I'm not going to listen to pastor. I'm not going to listen to my brothers and sisters. I will do whatever I want. I will. I will. I will. Exalt myself above God. You know, and that's the state that many are in. And they don't even realize it. And it's a sin. You know, you got so many people out there, you know what I mean? Like, man, they put their, their businesses, they put their employment, they put their vacations, they put their families, they put all those other things above doing the things of God. Man, I see it, man. And you know what? I don't even, I don't even want to speak on it no more, man. I don't even want to say, you know what, my family. I don't even want to say my friends. I don't, you know what? The proof is in the pudding. You know what? I know so many individuals who are happy with just going to church on Sunday. Why? Because they rather go on vacations. I know so many individuals that say that they love God, but yet, you know what? They'll put their business and they'll put other opportunities above everything else, but yet they love God. And they got everybody else surrounding them thinking that they love God. No, they don't. They don't love God. You know what? Pastor Ray told me a long time ago, and it got reaffirmed to me because a friend of mine sent me another video, a video that, that I watched, the same thing. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people that say that they love God. You know what? If you have a problem with getting to church, you don't love God. If you have a problem with obedience, guess what? You don't love God. And then see, just because I say that, people will want to get mad at me. You know what? You can go ahead and get mad at me and everybody else can go ahead and get mad at me. I don't care. I love God. That's why I go to church. I love God. That's why I push things off to the side and I put God first because I love God. You know, there's a difference. If you love God, you're going to do what God called you to do. You're going to do what he's asking of you. You're going to sacrifice. Guess what? Those other verses that we read, he says, instead of being joyful, instead of being all happy, I'm going to be sad. Instead of doing everything else that everybody else know, you know what? I'm going I'm to serve God. I'm going to get rid of everything and I'm going to serve the Lord with all my heart. You know, it is wrong to plan as if tomorrow were certain. Everybody's planning, oh, I got I to figure out for tomorrow. You know, people will miss church because, you know what, they, they want to have a, a get-together. Oh, I'm having a get-together at my house today. So where were you at at church? Oh, I had to make the food. What? You missed church because you had to make food. Oh, I didn't go to church. Why? Because I had to plan for a vacation that I'm going on tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. You know, and we're not supposed to be doing it. It's right there in the scripture. You know, Proverbs 3.28. We do not know what tomorrow holds. Our lives are as frail and unpredictable as a puff of smoke. God should be consulted in all our plans, and they should be made in His will. We should live and speak in the realization that our destinies are in His control. 
we should say, if the Lord wills, we should live and do this or that. Thus, in the book of Acts, we find the Apostle Paul saying, I will return again to you, God willing. I will return to you again, God willing. You know, and so many people have taken that verse out of context. Si Dios quiere. Yeah, the Lord wants to, but we don't want to. You know what? If the Lord lets me come again to over here, you know what I mean, next year or the, you know, a couple of years down the road, then, you know, it's the Lord's will. But I'm not promising you anything. Why? Because I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm following God. How many of you know that we make plans and it's out of the will of God? And in 1 Corinthians 4.19, he wrote, I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. Sometimes Christians employ the letters DV to express this sense of dependence on God. These letters are the initials of two Latin words, Dio Volante, meaning God willing. But now you boast in your arrogance, says James in verse 16. The Christians were priding themselves in their boastful plans for the future. They were arrogant in their confidence that nothing would interfere with their time schedule. They acted as if they were the masters of their own fate. All such boasting is sinful because it leaves God out. It leaves God out. Well, I'm going to do me, homie. I don't know about what you, you guys go do church. You guys do whatever. I'm going to do me. Why? Because I like going and riding boats. I like going in and, 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 and riding in fancy cars. I like going on doing on these. I like, you know, doing all these other things. Why? Because I'm going to do me. You guys do the church thing. You know, but after I get done doing me, if I'm in town for a week, then I'll come visit the church for a week. I'll come drop a couple, uh, a $20 bill in the offering plate so I can feel good about myself and say I pay my tithes. No. You're doing what you want to do. You ain't doing what God wants you to do. And you're far from the will of God. Far from the will of God. Why? Because you're doing you. And while you're doing you or they're doing them, guess what? The body's suffering. You know, there's individuals that, 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 that need, you know what I mean, other people around. Why? Because God wants to use them for his glory and for his honor. But yet they prefer to be absent from the body so that way they can do themselves. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. In verse 17, to do good in this context is to take God into every aspect of our lives. To live in the moment by moment de uh, dependence on him. If we know we should do this, yet fail to do it, we are clearly sinning. Man, if you ain't dependent upon God in every area of your life, you're blatantly sinning, church. We have to be dependent on, on everything with our health. How many times, you know what I mean? I understand that there's doctors. Don't get me wrong. I understand that there's doctors. I understand that some people, you know what I mean, have to take medications and do all these things. You know what? But are we depending on God? Or are we depending on a doctor? Are we depending on God? Or are we depending on a pastilla, on a pill? You know, who are we depending upon? You know what, God, I need you. Why? Because I don't want to be, you know, relying on these pills to get me through uh, every single day. You know what, God, I need you. Why? Because I don't want to have to run to the doctor every single time, you know what I mean, that it feels like I'm having a heart attack because I got heartburn. Instead of changing the way that, that I'm supposed to eat and to trust you, Lord God. You know what, Lord, I don't want to go run to all these, these people that call themselves godly to give me this advice when I should be running to church and falling down at the altar and listening to the very word of God. Amen. The very word of God. Bless you, my brother. You know, of course, the principle is of broader application. 
In any area of life, the opportunity to do good makes us uh, responsible to do it. If we know what is right, we are under obligation to live up to that light. Failure to do so involves us in sin against God, against our neighbors, and against ourselves. You got to understand that, you know what, we're just not letting God down. We're letting everybody else around us down. We're, we're failing everybody we're failing friends, we're failing family, we're failing strangers, we're failing God, everything. Everything around us. Why? Because we don't live for ourselves, man. We live for a higher purpose. We live for God, for God's plan and His purpose and His will. You know, you don't know who's watching you out there. You don't know who's looking up to you. I'll give you a perfect example, church. And I have to live, I've, I've been living with this for a very long time. And it kills me. There was a young boy, that his name was Desi Garza. I used to hang out with a guy, his name was Rodrigo Garza, and his little brother was, was Desi Garza. They had no father. Their father was an alcoholic. So all the family sold drugs. Except for the mom. I mean, the mom's always cooking tortillas and all that stuff. Oh, mijo, don't do that. Don't be tricky so much. Don't fight. Don't go to jail. Don't do this. You know, take care of yourself. Be good. And I remember I was in middle school, and they would bus us from the middle school over to, to the school that, by, by our house where we I think it was Twombly or something, but we would go over there, and I was his mentor. So I would go spend time with him during the day and I would help him do his homework and then we would do activities together like play basketball or football and everything and whatnot. And then I started getting involved in drugs. And I became, I, I'm going to do this. I will do this. And I, and I started doing me. And I remember running into him and this was probably about Right about a year before he died, at a very young age. He was only like probably 15 or 14 when he died. But I remember running into him and, and, and he, man, he gave me the most dirtiest look. And I was like, man, I was like, I go, you remember me, bro? He's like, yeah. He's like, I remember you. And he was just like, you know, like real cold with me, man. And I, and I never, you know what I mean, I never realized that I did anything, because I didn't really do nothing to him, you know what I mean? But I did, unknowingly. And he told me, he goes, you know what, he goes, I hate you. And I was like, what do you hate me for? He goes, because, he goes, you left me, like everybody else. He goes, you know what, he goes, I looked forward to those times when you would come spend time with me to help me do my homework because nobody ever done that with me before. I looked forward to those times you would come and, and, and play football and basketball and all that stuff with me because nobody else had ever done that with me before. And he goes, and you know what? And when you left me, it was like everybody else had left me. And he goes, you know what? I've hated you for it ever since. I was like, whoa. I didn't even realize it. And then he died. You know, and I had to live with that. That I failed somebody. You know how many of us fail people every single day and we don't even realize it because of our selfishness? Because we want to do what we want to do. And we don't even care. You know, our own brothers and sisters in Christ in the church, you know, we could care less if, if we leave and go to another church. You know what, I don't, I don't have to tell you nothing. You know what, I'm going to do me. I'm going to do what I, you know what, I, I don't have no responsibility. You know what, I don't have to say, hey, you know what, pastor, I've been praying and I just don't feel like, you know what I mean, like I fit in here anymore that, you know what, that the Lord's calling me to somewhere else. The audacity of people just to get up and leave without saying nothing. Why? Because they want to do them, and they think that they're living for God. They're living for themselves. Amen. You know, in chapter 4, James has put us on trial with regard 
to covetousness and conflict with regard to evil speaking and with regard to planning without consulting the Lord. Let us therefore ask ourselves the following questions. Am I continually anxious to get more or am I content with what I have? Am I content with what I have? Am I envious of those who have more than I do? Do I pray before purchasing? Shh. Huh? Amen. You know what? The Lord has been convicting me in this area. Man, for the first time in my life, I've actually been able to keep money in my wallet. And I'm talking about cash money, not, not a credit, not a card or a credit card. Why? Because before I would have money, it's like, you know what I mean? Like you have a hot coal in your pocket, just burning a hole in there. Man, it, or like, you know what I mean? It was like a Mexican jumping bean that couldn't wait to jump out and, and go somewhere or be spent. Man, it just goes in my wallet and it just stays in there. And I think about everything now. I'm like, man, you know what? We don't need that. Why do, you want, why do we want to go out, eat, out to eat for? There's food in the fridge. No, there's not. Yeah, there is. What is there? There's hot dogs. Oh, man, but I don't like hot I don't care. I don't like those kind of chips. I do. I don't like that. I don't, you know, because that's, that's what I tell myself. Man, they ain't Doritos, man. So I stopped buying Doritos and I started buying Lay's. Huh? Plain old simple potato chips. I said, man, they're good. That's all you need is potato chips. Man, two big old bags like that for a dollar, homie. What's up? Man, I'm telling you, start thinking about all that stuff. Do I really need, I don't need that. You know, do I, I don't need that. You know, God don't want me to have that. I want that, but God don't want me to have that. Just like with fasting. Huh? We want, but God don't want it for us. We want it. We want the Slim Jims. We want the Twizzlers. We want the nachos. We want the hot wings and the pizza. We want all this other stuff. You know, we want it. We're not even hungry, but we want it. But God wants more of us, man. God wants us. He said, man, come on. When God speaks to me, do I submit or do I resist? When God speaks to us, do we submit or do we resist? Do I speak against my brothers? And do I make plans without consulting the Lord? Do I make plans without consulting the Lord? I think a lot of us are guilty of that, right? You know, don't get me wrong on this one. I'm just going to throw this out there. But when somebody invites you to a Christmas party or to a birthday party or to a barbecue or to go out to eat, did you consult with God about it? Or did you just go, say, you know what, I'm just going to go do it. And then you get there, you know what I mean, and you're like, man, I just don't feel like I fit in right here. So, some, some ain't right. Some ain't right. You know, and I've been feeling more like this. Every time that I go around Individuals who call themselves Christians but are luke, luke, lukewarm. Not that I don't love them. I love them so much, but I'm doing them a dissatisfaction and I'm doing myself a dissatisfaction by bowing down to their level instead of getting closer to God. You know what? You do you, homie, all day long. You do you because that's what you're good at. But guess what? I'm going to put on Christ. Until you figure that out, that's between you and the Lord. That don't mean that I don't love you. That don't mean that, that I have anything foul or anything to say about you. You know what? That, that's your walk. That's your life. But you know what? I desire more of the Lord. I want to get closer to Christ. I don't want to miss the rapture. 
I don't want to miss the rapture. You know, I want to go to heaven. You know, will you stand with me here tonight, church?